Hello, I'm Chris Fowler for Sports Century. There was a primitive quality to him that was riveting. He crouched behind his defensive line, steam coming from his mouth, ready to pounce. Considered by many the greatest middle linebacker of all time, Dick Butkus looked like what a linebacker was supposed to look like. But he was also a complex man who struggled to find an identity off the field. Dick Butkus was a superman. <laughs> he was unbelievable. He just hated people and he just wanted to kill them and kill a quarterback. The idea is to utterly demoralize, demolish. Butkus's dream was to hit somebody so hard their head flew off. I think to play the game, and I've always said this, that you have to have a Neanderthal gene. Butkus had two. It was this focused, kind of violence that it brought him a certain kind of joy and you could see it on his face as he played he had passion uh, with his eyes darting left and right he also was hard of hearing he always went after the whistle stop he never stopped when the whistle blew i can recall um, catching a pass and uh, there was buckets and during that era the peace sign was very popular regardless of the war and he got me in a headlock and made a little peace sign and commenced to try to gouge my eyes out. It's always messing around. I come up to get over the ball and somebody would spit on the ball. Well, Butkus is back there giggling and, and I tell the official and the official doesn't do anything about it. And a couple plays later I come up and Butkus is giggling again and he spit on the ball again. Dick would run up into the line and start growling and just, you know, making noise. And I can remember one time while calling signals, Ed Flanagan was our center saying, shut up, Dick, so I can't hear the signals. I remember when O.J. Simpson was in the league, I said, uh, what was it like playing against Butkus? And he said, whenever I got the ball, I kept looking around saying to myself, where is he? Where is he? Everybody was terrified. I would talk to him and accuse him of some of the things, the biting and the gouging at the eyes. And, and he'll flat out deny it. It was almost like he was in a coma, you know, he was out of himself. He'll flat out deny it. I never did that. I never did that. Dick was in such a zone when he played that when he was off the field and came down from the excitement and the level at which he played, he didn't remember a lot of that stuff. Dick Buckus said before a game, he would pick out somebody on the other sideline and imagine that that person had done something to his family, done something to his mom, so that he could really hate them when the game started. He did this knowing that he was fooling himself, but using the device that an actor uses to get himself up for a role by imagining that he is that person in that story. I was dead serious. Um, uh, football was my life was like a release for me. I swore that if I was going to die, let it be on the field here. To watch him on a football field was to watch a man showing everybody how a middle linebacker should play. Everything was very contained. That football field was to him like a chessboard was to Bobby Fischer. It's like looking at a Van Gogh as opposed to a, uh, to a dolly. It was flow. It was movement. And when the ball was snapped, he instinctively knew where to go. It was the sixth sense that he had about the game. He would go almost sideline to sideline. Butkus would almost hurdle himself through the air occasionally to make a tackle, almost like a missile. A Butkus tackle is a classic tackle. It's a textbook type of thing where you drive through the ball carrier and, and he and the ball carrier ends up going backwards. He's rough as hell. He wouldn't tackle you like a normal linebacker would. He would wrap his arms around you and engulf you. You had nowhere to go. From 1965 to 1973, the sounds of Dick Butkus making tackles echoed across the playing fields of the NFL like cannon fire. And when he retired, a Chicago Bear forever, they told stories about him around the campfires. Anyone whose name has all those percussive sounds in it, Butkus, is not going to be playing in a tutu. He had the body, he had the name, he had the neck. It seemed like his face was always like too big for the helmet, stuck out, and he always had this, I don't know how the heck he did it. I mean, was, there was always blood trickling down that one side. He looked like an animal who was going to hurt you bad, 
And he liked that. He wanted people to think that. He wanted people to know that he was coming. It was all for effect. He understood the entertainment value of it very early. But certainly, uh, if somebody said he got bit at the bottom of the pile and it must have been Butkus, then I'm sure Butkus would probably not deny that just to keep up the image. In most people's minds, he is still the most powerful symbol of the violent nature of the game. People in pro football constantly will use Butkus's name as an adjective almost in, in, in talking about how tough a, a player is, uh, regardless of, of his position. Butkus was incomparable. Strange guy, a violent guy. His attitude was, uh, was not siege mentality, but ramparts mentality. He strode the ramparts. That's what he did behind the line. And he didn't challenge the opposition, he threatened them. In the last minute of a game in Detroit on October 24, 1971, a wide receiver named Chuck Hughes collapsed on the field and died. Many presumed that the 6'3", 245-pound Butkus was responsible. He wasn't. He was a victim of his reputation. I was back in coverage and I saw like Hughes walking toward me and just had this weird color and down he went. Our doctors were the closest ones to where he was so I started waving him in. Butkus had the image of being the last guy who would call for help for anybody. Well, here was the guy who was actually, actually dead on the field. Uh, something you never want to uh, imagine. I was a good maybe 10 yards away and had my hands on my hips. Someone from the end zone had maybe a long lens and took a shot of it. It's like uh, Butkus finally did it. There were people in Detroit who said Butkus must have hit him. Butkus is a killer. Butkus even got hate mail from Detroit. People immediately, when they hear Butkus' name or saw him do something, they were looking for the bad in it, you know, not for what really was transpiring. He was really recognizing that uh, Hughes was in trouble and, and that he wanted some help out there. Dick understood what was going on. When he came to the funeral, all the players went over and thanked him for, for that. Because he was big and because he sounded gruff, everybody thought he was rough. And the word animal used to really bother him. You know, so he's a very sensitive person and underneath. And I think that he felt uh, intimidated by his own reputation for intimidation. I think that he felt that uh, people largely misunderstood him. But this was very difficult. It was very difficult to get him to talk. You know, he said, gee, great game, Dick. Ah, thanks. Yeah. The man would not uh, expound on anything outside of answering your questions. Uh, he wanted to do his uh, talking on the field through his play. We coaches, we hardly even got a uh, hello out of him. He was just very, very focused. I think he was feeling for part of his life inadequate, feeling like, you know, he was on a different playing field with people. He studied and did things in his competitive nature to bring himself up to being at least equal, in many cases, surpassing people. Dick Butkus was born into a Lithuanian family of modest means on December 9, 1942, on the far south side of Chicago, in a section called Roseland. Growing up the youngest of eight children, he learned self-reliance from his parents, John and Emma. We grew up in a uh, working-class, blue-collar neighborhood that was primarily an ethnic area. Every four or five blocks, she went into a different nationality. Um, most of them being of European background. Steel mills were the primary employers. I think there was a lot of love in that family. They all pulled together. Uh, they had to. It was very tough for uh, Mrs. Butkus to feed that clan. The Butkus family is all a big physical family, and uh, Dick was kind of the skinny runt, being the last of the group, but he developed very quickly. His mother was an interesting person. She could get rough, and she could speak up for the family. I think part of Dick's competitive spirit come from her, um, she just assumed that everybody could be a star. He loved his father a great deal, but it was his mother to whom he went uh, with any kind of problem. And Dick would pour things out to her. She would listen. My dad was the real quiet one. He'd never say two words. Ma was the boss. 
she told you to do something, you did it. No questions asked. His father was an immigrant who came over on Ellis Island from New York, from Lithuania, and he spoke very broken English. He'd be looking at the paper from the back to the front, and, but he couldn't read. But he was just like looking at the paper. Dick communicated him. I think but he communicated with him more by looking at him and understanding what his dad was trying to say in a nonverbal way. His father would come down the street carrying his lunch bucket, and he would stop and he would smile and go into the house. That was a thousand words to Dick from his father. Dick was almost nonverbal growing up. I was one of the few people that he really conversed with. At school, he always had his head down. He walked with his head down and was very, very shy, um, said very little to teachers. He was inside himself. I think it's just something you develop when you're left to your own devices. And even though you're in a family that had a lot of members, um, as the youngest, he was he was he was lonely. I'm shy outside to other people, but not not with the people I was close to. You really had to prove your trust to me that you were loyal. Uh, then it was okay. I don't know why that was. Uh, I don't know. Introverted and often alone, Butkus found a friend for a lifetime in football. In his yard and at nearby Fernwood Park, he immersed himself in the game. At Fernwood, he would play alone. He would go to the park and he would uh, run through the trees and spin off the trees and he would kick the football and he would run it back. It's hard to play by yourself, so I would just manufacture and do things and do it late at night because probably being shy, uh, you know, I don't want anybody seeing, probably being afraid that people think, you know, you're a little off center. In that large family of guys, Dick got lost somewhere. Football was for him a way of expression to free himself from being lost within that family. In 1956, Butkus was introduced to organized football. He attended Chicago Vocational High School, even though he had to take two buses to get there. He chose it because its football program was renowned. At Chicago Vocational School, he was bigger than anybody, better than anybody. He was like a man playing against boys. He was like Gulliver. I mean, he was huge then. He was the, the biggest name in, in high school football in the years that he played. We had heard that he was the toughest guy that ever played the game. We heard rumors about him biting people. We heard rumors about all kinds of different things. His restlessness sometimes landed him in trouble. As a junior, Butkus was arrested and spent two nights in a juvenile detention center after being caught red-handed while stealing a part off a hot rod. He was sentenced to a year of probation. That served as his epiphany. That was the make or break point, and his mother and father were deeply embarrassed and ashamed that their son had gotten arrested. If you're first generation, you're driven by the obsessiveness of a mother and father who made sacrifices to come to this country to start a new life. Dick had this imperative. So if you put the imperative together with the imagination and the loneliness, you come up with one obsessive guy. All of a sudden, it, it hit Dick. Oh my God, if I pull this one more time, my whole career is gonna be over. In the spring of 1961, Dick Butkus enrolled at the University of Illinois on a football scholarship. He was 100 miles from home, and because freshmen were ineligible, he didn't have the comfort of games. So a lonely young man became even lonelier and more withdrawn. He sat in the back row, and he struck me as a very large man. And all the Chicago students sort of sat in a semicircle around him. His first paper in freshman English, why did you come to Illinois? And his was that he had come to Illinois to play football, and he was going to take us to a Rose Bowl. I think he, he just was trying to figure it all out. I think it was such a much bigger deal than what we all thought when we came to Illinois. He endured the classrooms, but his real refuge was on the practice field. The first day of practice, Dick was on the field. 
all of our coaches watched him uh, go through drills in the first scrimmage that we had. And uh, it was very clear that here uh, with us was going to be the opportunity to coach the best linebacker that had maybe ever played. He made two or three tackles immediately uh, on inside running plays, but then we ran a, a bootleg pass, and he ran stride for stride with that man going across, never practiced this play. He just instinctively went right with him, intercepted the pass, we said, he'll do. I think it might have been one or two practices that everybody on that field knew there was one king of the jungle, and <laughs> he was a freshman. <laughs> In June of 1963, Butkus married his high school sweetheart. Helen was a stabilizing influence, and he played with the fury of something unleashed, both as a center and middle linebacker. As a junior, he made 145 tackles and caused 10 fumbles, while leading Illinois to a Rose Bowl victory and a number three spot in the rankings. After the Rose Bowl, I think he became much more comfortable, much more verbal, um, and enjoyed the experience. I think it was like a secret happiness that uh, they did win the Rose Bowl. I'm sure he was happy, but he, he doesn't show it a lot. He thinks that um, I don't need a lot of thank yous because this is what I'm supposed to do. In August, just before his senior year, he's been made All-American junior year. His life is good. He's at ease with everything. Maybe the first time ever. There was also this blossoming articulation and ease and SI sends uh, a writer out Dan Jenkins very good writer and Dan spends a couple of days with him and Helen he was interviewed for three or four days following the classes went every place with him Dick did everything he could you know to be accommodating and he was but the story came out making him look like an animal and it was not the true Dick Butkus. And it was just, uh, you know, it had that attitude toward it. But it was a perfectly legitimate story by Jenkins. I mean, there was nothing wrong with it. He had his own take on things and portrayed Dick as being this dumb jock who didn't care anything about football. Dick apparently said words to the effect that if he wanted to be a doctor, he would study to be a doctor. But he wanted to play football, and that's why he had come to Illinois. And the words came out that he said, if I was smart enough, I would be a doctor. But I'm not, and I'm going to play football. The school, the academians, were infuriated. Uh, it, in their judgment, it made Illinois look like a football factory, and that made Butkus look like uh, someone who didn't belong in their university. He had to apologize. I would say it was a loss of innocence. And from that point on, I think that Dick has been very guarded. He, his privacy, it made him guarded against uh, giving uh, too much of himself or in, uh, sharing too much of what his beliefs are uh, with uh, writers. I'd always get burned, either, you know, misquoted or whatever and make you look like you're stupid. When he got stung, he started building what a lot of people call now is his crust or his anger or whatever. He, he shuns people who he thinks is going to take advantage of him. So he's never really got on top of that issue. He, he's probably got a lot of calluses from it. Playing in Chicago and uh, being being from Chicago is, uh, is a great help right there, but you can't play football all your life because there's more things in football, there's, and as you get older, you realize these things. In the 1965 draft, when the Bears were only two years removed from the NFL championship, they selected two future Hall of Famers, Gail Sayers and Dick Butkus. But all that promise went unfulfilled after a 9-5 and five rookie year. In Butkus' last eight years, Chicago had only one winning season and never reached the playoffs. Why were they so bad? Here they have this great linebacker. They have this great running back, Sayers. The defense was quite good, and the offense was extremely weak. It was a one-dimensional team, and the defense had to battle furiously to stay in the game. 
I remember him uh, at Soldier Field just screaming and, and, and yelling at his own players, and I intercepted three passes, and, and he was, as the quarterback was coming off the field, and he was screaming at him, you a he says, he wears a blue shirt, he doesn't wear a black shirt, he says, throw it to the black shirt. The offense was so bad when Dick was playing that when the opposition would surrender the ball, and the defense, Butkus and company, would walk off the field as the offense walked on, Dick would say, try to hold him, will you? When Butkus retired, he held the NFL record for opponents' fumbles recovered, 25. He also made 22 interceptions. But because wins were so hard to come by for the Bears, he had to find his victories wherever he could. Usually, that was in one-on-one -on -one scrums. One time, I fired out on a sweep, and I caught him, and I sort of set him to the side. He got mad, and he threw a roundhouse punch at me, and I saw the punch coming, and I thought, well, what's he going to do, hurt his hand? When he threw that roundhouse, his fingernail got in, and he slipped me right under the eyelid. We got into the game in uh, about the fourth quarter, and we're losing. I think we're down 17. Maybe maybe two minutes left. We're on defense, so he calls the, the play. We go back out. And in those days, you know, they didn't go down on one knee. And all of a sudden, Butkus calls a timeout. Ten seconds left. It's first down. Everyone looks like, oh man, what's he doing? You know? I finally figured out what he's doing. Go run 100 miles an hour and flying and snap the ball, smash him and jump up and call a timeout because you want another five hits on the guy. You know, before the game was over. When Chicago played Detroit, Butkus made it personal. It felt like real lions and bears going at each other. Charlie Sanders tried to make a necklace out of my teeth. I mean, he just hit me so hard, cracked me all the way across here. Come back to the huddle, and I'm bleeding like a pig. And Dick looks at me and says, what happens? So what do you think happened? And a few plays later, Charlie Sanders went over the middle. Dick hit him and caught him right in the chest, right in the head, and leveled him. He hit was so hard that I actually didn't feel it. You know, you hear people say, well, you know, I was shot, but I didn't feel the bullet. I think he hit me so hard it actually numbed me. Butkus embodied the brawny city for which he played. In his raw passion and ferocity, he was Chicago, the poet Carl Sandburg's city of big shoulders, and the people embraced him. In his first eight seasons, he averaged 120 tackles and 58 assists and was named to the Pro Bowl every year. He's a great example of what this city is. I don't think this city is a boisterous city. I don't think this city is a loud city. This city is a strong, hardworking, blue-collar city, and that's what Buckus was. It's iconic. It became mainstream iconic with Rocky and Sylvester Stallone calling his dog Buckus. Oh, it represents that aspect of the male personality that goes to war and fights for its country. It's our testosterone, it's our upbringing. But this is one of those iconic male figures. designed for a collision. All the more reason there are so many angles on the Acura MDX that are. Take advantage of attractive lease rates on the 2009 Acura MDX for well-qualified customers. Want a great holiday gift idea for under $15? Introducing MicroTouch Magic, the magical micro trimmer with the built-in light. It spotlights the hair and makes it disappear. Look, now you see it, now you don't. It magically goes where other trimmers can't. Embarrassing nose hair, gone like that. Unsightly ear hair, watch it disappear. Need to trim the back of your neck? With Magic, you can do it by yourself. Look, it gets as close as a blade, yet it's 